fitting we should welcome another state. This is the first time since 1912 that there's been a change in the American flag. Another white star will be added to the background of blue. Last week here in Sacramento when I announced to a crowd of 15,000 that Alaska had just been voted into the United States, there was a spontaneous applause. A new ripple of excitement swept the entire country and for the first time many Americans became conscious of the great and beautiful country to the north. Alaska is twice as big as Texas and may eventually become one of the wealthiest states in the Union. For several years, the hour of decision has been heard in all the principal cities of Alaska, and on a number of occasions, we have been invited to conduct crusades in those cities to the north. Among the quarter of a million people that live in that beautiful, wild, frontier country are hundreds of Christians. It is my prayer that Alaska will not only contribute economically and politically, but also spiritually and morally to these United States at the most critical period of our history. Here in Sacramento, the capital of the Golden State of California, we've seen something happen that has no parallel in our ministry thus far. For the first time, we have held a one-week crusade. This has been an experiment. We can only hold two or three major lengthy crusades a year. We have invitations from scores of cities throughout the world that we can never possibly get to in a lifetime. We ask the Lord to show us this week what could be done in a one-week crusade in a city. He has done far beyond our expectations and anticipations. We've seen crowds from 15,000 to 20,000 people a night. We've already had nearly 5,000 people to walk down these aisles at the fairgrounds to receive Christ as Savior. The entire city has been conscious of the moving of the Spirit of God. Thus, we are giving serious thought to holding one-week crusades in many cities during the course of a year, rather than spending so long in one center as we did in New York or San Francisco. As God has answered your prayers here and sent spiritual refreshment to the capital of California, so we would appreciate your continued prayers as we go to other California cities in the next two weeks. Millions of Americans are in their automobiles going and coming from mountain and beach resorts. Yet in spite of our pleasures, recreation and amusement, there's a serious note this year as the nation contemplates its problems at home and abroad. This weekend, we've been reading editorials in magazines and newspapers and listening to speeches. In all of them, there's a note of warning, caution, and uncertainty. Robert M. Hutchins said, We are living in a time of crisis which produces a world which must live in perpetual fear. An American senator said, The Third World War seems to be inevitable. A German scientist says, It is now possible to depopulate the entire earth. Professor Weber says, We're at the end of history as we know it. William Volk says, the day of judgment is at hand. A few Sundays ago, the television program Frontiers of Faith presented a program called The End of It All. Interviewed by Leon Pearson were Canon Howard A. Johnson of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York and a scientist, Dr. Lincoln Barnett. They corroborated in the opinion that nature is out to kill us and in the end, she will succeed. Dr. Barnett said, the sun is slowly burning out. The elements are disintegrating. The world is slowly burning up. Time is running out. Nature moves just one way. Though this eminent scientist said that in scientific research there are more mysteries than we can cope with, when one mystery is solved, another looms on the horizon as a challenge. There was one thing that stood out. Science and theology are both in agreement that the end of the world is not only a possibility and a probability, but a certainty. Science has at long last brought itself abreast of the world's most authoritative book, which says, But the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. In the words of Dr. Barnett, a material scientist, he says this, Astrophysicists tell us that the sun will expand until it engulfs Mercury and other planets in our solar system, and the temperature of the Earth will be raised to 1500 degrees, which is sufficient to kill every living thing on our planet. All this underscores one fact, which runs cross-grain to the popular conception that existence on this planet will run uninterrupted for billions of years to come, and that fact is this, that we are pilgrims and strangers on our Earth that is marked for change. 
For centuries, man has asked the age-old question, will the end of the world come at some point in history? Many scientists are predicting that there is a possibility of the end of the world as we know it within a relatively short time. Thus, even on this weekend, there is much speculation about the future of the human race itself. No Bible student or scholar would dispute the fact that the Bible teaches that at some point in history, God will intervene and that there shall come an end to the world system as we know it. There are several conceivable ways the world could be destroyed, even on the natural level. First, man could consume himself by his own wickedness. This is what happened in Noah's day. God looked down and saw that every imagination of men's hearts was on the evil continually. The quality of life that men had made for themselves did not justify their continued existence. Death was the logical preference to continued life, and God's destruction of the race was therefore both an act of mercy and judgment. The race committed spiritual suicide by persisting in its evil and wickedness. The Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. The world we live in is terrifyingly wicked. Though we make our false boasts that America is Christian, our crime rate is staggering. In the current uniform crime report issued by the FBI, it is revealed that crime is up 9% over 1957 and 23% over the average for the previous five years. We have broken all previous records in this enlightened, progressive, scientific year of 57-58 for crime, selfishness, and wickedness. But you say, these crimes are committed by criminals and you're overlooking the fact that most people are law-abiding citizens. While it is true, that the average man escapes the sheriff, and that is to his credit, we are all responsible for creating an atmosphere which breeds crime. Our overemphasis of the importance of money, our distorted advocacy of materialism as opposed to the things of the spirit, our utter neglect of God and the moral law, all these contribute to the cultivating of crime and the criminal. Add to these, some film producers who for a few paltry dollars of profit sell their talent to the scum mongers, parading sex, glorifying crime, and commercing in violence. Standing condemned also are the brewery and distillery companies who through colorful ads in our magazines claim virtues for their products out of all proportion to their true worth. The criminal may reason that if wealthy men can lie for profit, then they are justified in breaking an equal commandment for another kind of profit. All of us, in one way or another, even by our apathy, are contributing to a condition that has earned for America the name the most lawless country in the world. Add to all of this our deluge of divorces, the torrent of child crime, our rising incidence of alcoholism, our racial bitterness and the quarrelsomeness and petulance of the average citizen, and you have a portrait of a civilization that is consuming itself by its own wickedness. One way our world as we have known it could end is for civilization to die at its own hand, as have 21 other civilizations before us. Rome was dead before she was burned to a crisp by a fateful fire. Pompeii was crushed under her own wickedness and perversion before the lava of Vesuvius finally finished her off. Babylon was dead morally before she died actually. For civilizations as well as people, the wages of sin is death. Another way our world could be destroyed is by a war of modern weapons. It is common knowledge that the world is now divided into two enemy camps. Both sides have developed fantastic weapons that could destroy civilization. One side has even announced their determination to control the world. They talk glibly of peace, but have in their hands the weapons that could destroy most of the world if they decide to use them. Their godless philosophy, their avowed atheism, their announced plans for world domination, and their past record all speak eloquently of what might happen on some dark day in the future. A prominent person recently in a television interview said that casualties in the first 30 minutes of an H-bomb attack could easily surpass 10 million and it is conceivable that millions would die during the first week of a nuclear war if indeed it were to last that long. Scientific man has fashioned a Frankenstein that stalks him through the night hours and casts deep shadows across his path that has in the past been given over to revelry and fun. The dominant emotion this weekend of modern man subconsciously is fear and uncertainty and frustration. 
Jesus' words seem very appropriate for these times. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distresses of nations with perplexity and the sea waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and for looking for those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That phrase, and the sea waves roaring, also takes on special significance in the light of what the scientist Lincoln Barnett had to say on the end of it all. He said that the Soviets were attempting to melt the tundra, their northern ice cap, to make more arable land by sprinkling black dust on the snow. The black dust absorbs the rays of the sun, creating more heat, and eventually they will be able to till the soil that is now covered with millions of tons of ice. Scientists estimate that when this is accomplished, that the water level of the oceans will be raised 33 feet. This means that all of the world's seaports will be covered with water, and many of the world's great cities will be flooded by water. Picture the result, for example, in New York City, if the ocean level were to rise 33 feet. Conjecture? Imagination? Foolish dreaming? No. These are the predictions of men of science who deal in facts, not fancy. Just to what extent God will allow human instrumentality to accomplish this destruction, we are not sure. However, the Bible is in agreement with science that the end of it all is on the agenda. In the last chapter of the last book of the Bible we read, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. The world as we know it is labeled for judgment. It is a temporary abode and we are but pilgrims and strangers en route to another destination far beyond this boundary of time and space. When the disciples asked Jesus, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus calmly and quietly in the 24th chapter of Matthew told them what would take place before the destruction of this planet. He spoke of wars and rumors of wars, of intense persecution of the righteous, of false prophets that would arise and deceive many, of abounding iniquity and the waning devotion of many of the intensified preaching of the gospel, of the desecration of holy things and the mounting hatred of man toward man. When you shall see these things, he said, know that it is near, even at the very doors. He also said, but of the day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. This fact we know, when and how is an uncertainty. Nature is out to kill us, say the scientists. The weapons are out to destroy us, they declare. But God is out to save us. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The only person in heaven on earth who loves without selfishness, gives no thought of reciprocation, and saves without collecting a fee is the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you. He wants to save you out of this decaying world in which we live. As God saved Noah thousands of years ago from a civilization that was to be destroyed in judgment, God wants to save you today if you're willing to repent of sin and receive His Son, Jesus Christ. All who place their lives under His control, He remakes in His image and likeness. And in His great compassion, He is fashioning a place uncorrupted by lust, crime, and greed, where we can spend eternity in fellowship with Him. And when this world, so marked by sin, so ravished by violence, and so shot through with perversion, shall have passed away, and the redeemed shall be taken to their long home, we shall hear a great voice declare, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Ladies and gentlemen, for the Christian, there is great and glorious and wonderful hope. I have not seen, nor hath it entered into the heart of man, what God has prepared for them that love him. I am glad today that by his grace and mercy, I am in the kingdom of God. My sins have been forgiven. I know that I'm going to heaven. I have no fear as I look into the future. What about you? Have you received Christ? Have you been born into the kingdom of God? Are you ready for the judgment that is to come? Or are you spending all of your time building for this world that will soon pass away? The Bible says the world and the lust thereof shall pass away, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Become a partaker of eternal life and spend eternity with God. That is the blessed hope. That is the glorious hope that this Christ shall someday come back. This Christ that died on the cross and shed his blood for your sins. This Christ that came as Savior shall someday come as King of kings and Lord of lords. And those of us 
that have humbled ourselves with Him at the cross, those of us that have denied self and taken up our cross and followed Him, those of us that have repented of our sins shall spend eternity with Him. What a hope! What a glorious, triumphant hope is ours in Christ. You can share it too today by giving your life to the Savior. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank Thee and praise Thee for the blessed hope that in spite of a world that is going to pass away, we are anchored in Jesus Christ and we have hope, peace and joy and assurance and security. We pray that many this day, listening to this message, shall come to know the Savior. For we ask it in His name. Amen. I'm going to ask that we bow our heads in prayer. Our Father and our God, we pray today that Thy Holy Spirit will come as wind to blow, as fire to burn. We pray that Thy Holy Spirit will convict us, convert us. May we not be the same after being here today. And may above all, Christ Jesus our Lord be honored and glorified and magnified. For we ask it in his name. Amen. It is very difficult for me to express on behalf of our team all the things that are upon my heart. I would like to say that we've learned several things since we've been in Sydney, and one of them is that the weather changes very rapidly here. Last night I was looking up at what I thought was the stars, and all of a sudden it came a downpour. And yet here you are, in the cold and in the rain today, to come to this closing set. We will never forget it. And I read in the paper that Nearly 30% of the people in Sydney had either a cold or the flu. And in spite of that, you're here. And I believe that this is one of the greatest demonstrations that I can ever remember. And you have come today to honor and to worship Christ, not me or my team. It would be like Christ riding the donkey into Jerusalem and they were taking off the olive branches and taking off their clothes and putting them in the way and the donkey could have said, my, look at this, what they're doing for me. Why, there's never been a donkey in history like me. Look at the people coming out to see me roll down that road into Jerusalem. They hadn't come to see the donkey. They'd come to see the master. And I'm only the donkey today. And the glory and the honor and the praise must go to God. This has been his doing. And it has been the greatest month we have ever spent. Never before have we fallen in love with the people as we have the people of Sydney. And I talked to my wife on the phone this morning to wish her a happy Mother's Day. And I told her, I said, one of the objectives I have in life, if the Lord spares me, is to bring you here to this country. I want you to see it, because it's one of the most fabulous places we've ever been. And when we return to America, I hope that we will be a good ambassador for Australia and tell something of the wonders and the stamina and the strength and the greatness and the love and the hospitality of the people down under as we stay there. But now I hope that as we come to the conclusion of the crusade, this phase of it, that all of you will go back to your churches with the same enthusiasm and the same work and the same faithfulness that you've given to the crusade. This crusade will have gone down in history as a failure unless an impact is made on the churches of New South Wales. So I hope that all of you will go back to your churches more faithful and more loyal than ever before 
face to face and say I am your sister. And let's pray that the spirit of awakening and revival will continue in this city and in this state. And as we go, we go with a part of our heart left in Sydney. And we want to consider ourselves at least honorary Sydneyites from now on. Now I want you to turn with me for our closing message today to the seventh chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel, the seventh chapter, beginning at verse 13. Matthew 7, beginning at verse 13. I'm going to be somewhat brief in what I have to say today because I know that it's a bit chilly and windy. The sun is shining beautifully, but after my experience for the last few days, it could be pouring down rain in the next 30 seconds. And so I'm going to be brief. Let's begin at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which do in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. In this passage of Scripture, we have come to it deliberately from the Sermon on the Mount. There are many people that say, I live for the Sermon on the Mount. I don't need to be converted to Christ. And many people say that their religion is just to pay the golden rule, and that's enough. But the difficulty is, all of us don't obey the golden rule. And we take one portion out of the Sermon on the Mount and forget other parts of the Sermon on the Mount. For example, you go down a few more verses and you read this. Whereby, by their fruit, ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. In other words, Jesus is speaking to tax people here, to religious people. And he's saying, you call me Lord, Lord, Lord. But you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. But only he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In other words, we preach. We taught the Sunday school in thy name. And in thy name we cast out devils, death of angels, and absolute, winning people to Christ. And in my name done many wonderful works. He has great social works that we've done in Christ's name. And we're going to come in that day and claim this as our word to enter the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, and then I will confess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I didn't say that. Christ said that. All through Southeast Asia, the number one topic of conversation is what is happening in Red China. This is considered the greatest human experiment in history. A nation comprising one-fifth of the human race is being transformed in one generation. Individual freedom is gone, and the normal family life existence of centuries that gave China one of the oldest and greatest cultures in the world is being destroyed. An entire nation is being driven to live in communals where love and home are only memories. It is true that great material progress is evident, but at what a price. Christ said, man shall not live by bread alone, but red China is trying it. India is frightened, and even Russia is appalled by the scope of a communist experiment that Russia would not dare to imitate. An Indonesian political leader recently said, it is terrifying, we are frightened. An Australian visitor to red China said a few days ago, I never once saw a couple in that nation of 670 million people making love or holding hands. It is a nation of ceaseless activity and effort. He predicted that communist China would become one of the world's greatest powers within 10 years. Can China succeed in building a nation without love and even the elemental freedoms that we thought necessary to human existence? In America, psychiatrists have been pondering the plight of a nine-year-old boy who, because of lack of love, has become obsessed with the notion that he is a machine. Before eating his meals, Joy would string an imaginary wire from an imaginary electrical outlet to the table. 
Insulating himself with paper napkins, he would plug himself in before he could eat. Joey needed motors, radio tubes, and transistors to run him through the day. Sometimes, when disturbed, he would explode abruptly and violently, hurling his tubes and bulbs and screaming, Crash! Crash! How did Joey get this way? The doctor's answer was significant and shocking. Joey's father had been an Air Force pilot, continually on the move. He had no time to give Joey proper love. His mother did not care for him. Joey was a child who had been robbed of love and affection. Since he was denied any sign of human emotion in his parents, he rejected all human feeling in himself. It was then that he became preoccupied with gadgets and machinery. They became his objects of interest, and he believed that machines were superior to human beings. But he became a problem to himself and others because the element of love was lacking in his life. Underneath his mechanical shell, Joey was starved for love. Once warmed by human affection, Joey's life and faith in gadgets began to dissolve. Later, he wrote, feelings are more important than anything under the sun to me now. We look out on a world today that is starving itself of love. This is the problem in communist China today. There is a lack of love, and the people are beginning to starve for human affection. In our juvenile delinquents, we see a million other joys who are what they are because of the absence of the love factor in their lives. Their behavior is conditioned by an utter lack and understanding from their parents and society. In Red China, we see a frantic effort to make a conditioned, brainwashed man to be used as grist for the state. We see a Martian monstrosity with an outsized head and a small heart. Love, faith, and idealism are ruled out as mere remnants of the old antiquated regime. Even in America, we see millions who are no less obsessed with the gadgets of materialism than poor little joy or the communist in China. They are wanton slaves of secularism, driven by some strange power to burn out their lives in a mad pursuit for material possessions, pleasures, and entertainment. Clinging limply to a theoretical god once worshipped by their fathers, their heart and soul is propelled by a lust to get all they can here and now. So little joy, the mechanical boy, becomes a symbol of modern man here, there, and everywhere. Even the stalemate between East and West is in itself a glowing example that underneath the skin, men are the same. The Soviets talk of peace but are feverishly preparing for war. The West hints at war but really wants peace. We are wired and plugged into our own point of view and like little joy are screaming, crash, crash, and the crash will come. And if the world continues to ignore the love of God and the love that God can shed abroad in the hearts of men, we are going to see a crash that will end at the great judgment of God. Man is created in the image of God. He was made for love. That is the reason God created man, because God loves and God wanted an object to love. He created man so that man could return to love. Man is dependent on love. And without this love from God, and love back to God and love to his fellow man, man will never find happiness and peace no matter what his material prosperity may be. The Bible says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. Again, the Bible says in 1 John 4, we love him because he first loved us. The Bible again says, everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Love in the purest sense is of God. Every man may have a semblance of love, and in his higher moments even the degenerate may have feelings bordering on real love. This is what we might call love by diffusion. But the love that God sheds abroad on the human heart of a true believer is love by infusion. It then becomes not an occasional thing, but a power that dominates our lives. Love clarifies the understanding, mollifies chaste spirits, soothes irritabilities, balances judgment, promotes leniency and patience, roots out selfishness, and makes it possible for people of diverse temperaments, views, and social affinities to dwell together and work in happy cooperation. But to find love defined in sheer poetry, we must turn to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Dr. F. B. Meyer once said, this beautiful gem of love lies between two chapters of argument, like a pure lakelet nearing the blue sky, set as a jewel in an encasement of jade. In this chapter, Paul tells us of a more excellent way, 
of a path more transcendent than any other gifts. And then rising on wings of inspired utterance, he pulls forth his glorious hymn of Christian love, mounting higher and higher on a grand crescendo. He climaxes his classic hymn with these words, And now abided faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Like a prism, refracting the rays of the sun and reflecting all the colors of the rainbow, the light of inspiration shining through the pages of the scriptures reveals the full or beauty of God's love. In the three texts that I've already read, for our consideration today, we see the three-dimensional sweep of the love of God. First, we see God's love for us. The scripture says God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Penetrating through the gloom and despair of the sin-cursed world today, even in the darkest hours of our present history, is the persistent fact that God loves men. The scripture says, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. And the crowning demonstration of this infinite love took place on Golgotha, where God's love for men was tested in the crucible of suffering as he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God proved his love on the cross. When Christ hung and bled and died, it was God saying to the world, I love you. Man is dependent on that love, and without that love, all would go. True love is always costly. It's never cheap. And the proof of love is its capacity to suffer for the object of its affection. Love is also reciprocal. Unless there is a human response to divine love, unless we can say, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, we have not entered into a love pact nor can we taste of the powers of the world to come, nor can we find complete happiness and joy and peace here and now in the scheme of things in which we find ourselves as human beings today. To a world held in the grip of hatred, prejudice, intolerance, and misunderstanding, God is faithfully, patiently, and earnestly commending his love toward us. And those who have opened their hearts with faith, he has shed this love abroad in their hearts by the Holy Spirit. And God's ideal world would be if every man loved God, and then this love would be shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit for our fellow man. Then would the world know peace. But as long as human nature is as it is today, there is no possibility of peace because man's own heart is not at peace. And the international problems are only reflections of individual problems. To a world held in the grip of hatred and prejudice, God is saying, I love you. And God is also asking that our love be returned to him. Some of you listening to my voice today are held in the grip of resentment, ill will, and cankering hatred. Your soul has become shriveled, deadened, and irresponsive. God stands ready to shed his love abroad in your heart. If you would receive his son by faith, if you will receive his gift, that's all God asks, that you receive his gift, Christ, by faith, then he performs a supernatural miracle in your heart and gives you a love that is beyond yourself. Secondly, we see the transforming power of love. 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. It was Henry Drummond who spoke of the expulsive power of a new affection. When we are possessed of an all-consuming love, it forces by compression all the debris and filthiness from our hearts. A bashful farmer boy near where I live, who after months of awkward courting, finally said to the girl he loved, Mary, I've been loving you for a long time. I'm not much good at talking, but will you be my wife? Mary replied, Yes, John, I've been loving you too. I'll be happy to be your wife. Late that night when John was alone, he looked up at the stars and was heard to say, Oh Lord, I ain't got nothing again anybody now. That is what love does. When we love God with all of our hearts, then we have the capacity to love our fellow man. And that's the thing the world is lacking. We talk peace, peace, peace when there is no peace. We tell people to love each other. Our different races, but they don't have the capacity to love each other. Why? Because they need the love of God shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Spirit. And this will only take place when we've been to the cross and received Christ as our Lord and Savior. God's love is extended to us vertically. And as we respond perpendicularly, 
a spiritual radar is established and we're brought into intimate contact with him. Thus, we love him because he first loved us. Many of us are like the Roman soldier who with spear in hand was intent on destroying the Son of God. We jeer him, we mock him, and we crucify him in thought, word and deed. But when we thrust that cruel spear into his side and saw the red blood of the Son of God poured out in love for him, he said softly, Surely this must have been the Son of God. Anyone who views Calvary as the all-suffering act of an all-loving Savior must with any soul say, See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love pour mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet or forms compose so rich a crown? Yes. When we respond to the love of God, when we say, Just as I am without one plea, O Lamb of God, I come, a transforming miracle takes place in our lives. Our affections, our will, and our intellect undergo a complete transforming change. This is what the love of God can do for you today if you will respond to God's love. Thirdly, we see a change in our attitude toward others. Everyone that loveth him that beget Loveth him also that is begotten of him, says 1 John 5, 1. This love principle was the driving force of the first century church. Its purifying force kept the stream of early Christianity powerful and effective. Peter said, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. The world looks in vain today for a demonstration of Christian love and forbearance. Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, in that ye have love one to another. What does the world see when it looks at the church today? Division, strife, hatred, jealousy is prevalent in the church today. A sin in the sight of God and is a stumbling block to the world. The greatest excuse given to me on the part of people in every country as to why they don't become Christians is because of divisions among Christians today. Instead of being long-suffering, we are too often short-tempered. Instead of being fervent in spirit, we are too often insipid of soul. The church needs to rediscover the power of Christian love. A Christian soldier in a Scottish regiment was asked how he was brought to Christ. He said, there was a private in our same company who was converted at Malta before the regiment came to Egypt. We sure gave that fellow an awful time. The devil got possession of me and I made that man's life miserable. And so I thought, well, one night, a terrible wet night, he came in from sentry watch. He was very tired and wet and before getting into bed he got down to pray. My boots were heavy with wet and mud and I let him have one on the side of his head and the other on the other side. But he just went on with his prayers. Next morning, I found those boots beautifully polished by the side of my bed. This was his reply to me. It just broke my heart. And that morning, I was saved. I gave my life to Jesus. Love had won me. In a world that is being run by formulas, by gadgets, a sort of a wired up, plugged in existence, man was made not a machine, but in the image of God. Man was made not for the state, but for fellowship with God. Thanks be unto God in these days of unrest. Thousands are responding to the love of God as exemplified in the cross of Jesus Christ. We have recently seen tens of thousands in Australia step out in response to the challenge of the cross. Why don't you, who are tired of empty, purposeless living, begin right now to live by the faith of the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. Right now, you can give your life to Jesus Christ. Three things are necessary. First, repentance. Secondly, to receive Christ by faith, which is an act of your will. And thirdly, a willingness to obey him. And you can settle it and begin this life today. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that thy Holy Spirit will baptize us with love. Convict us. Convert us. Consecrate us, and may we know something of the love of God to us, of our love to him, and our love to our fellow men. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. During this past week, an outstanding businessman here in Louisville came to me and said, My life is a complete wreck. I've spent $1,100 this past year on psychiatrists. They cannot patch me up. 
I'm too far gone to save. The only hope for me is if God would remake me. My mind immediately flew to Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, and the wonderful story of the potter's house. Jeremiah says, Then went I down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then Jeremiah also went on to quote God as saying, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand. Here is a vivid picture of life painted by the prophet Jeremiah. He portrays God as the divine potter and man as the impassive clay which the master artist seeks to make into a vessel of usefulness. But in the process, the vessel becomes marred. A flaw appears in the work and tenderly the skilled craftsman of life refashions it to his own liking. What an accurate portrayal of man this is. We, like that vessel, were made of earth. The Bible says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Three words stand out boldly in this parable of the potter. Made, marred, and mended. First, he made it. Man, in his vaunted pride and self-styled wisdom, would claim that he is self-created. He would wrest himself from the skillful hands of the potter and cry, I evolved, and I'm a product of natural law. I'm self-created. Rational man would devise all sorts of theories to convince himself that he came into being quite independent of Almighty God. But despite all his claims of self-creation, the record and evidence indicates that it was otherwise. The Bible says that God said, let us make man in our own image after our own likeness. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, and God blessed them. Just why God chose the tiny earth, an infinitesimal grain of sand on the beach of the universe, as the base of this operation, I cannot explain. Perhaps like the potter who searches for clay especially suited to mold a vessel of beauty and loveliness, God found on this remote little planet the material he desired to make a creature of unspeakable loveliness for his own good pleasure. And notice, he did not make man haphazardly, but with an infinite plan and purpose. He made him in his own image and likeness, a creature which he could commune, companion, and fellowship with. You were made for God's fellowship, and to fulfill any other purpose in your life is to fail to fulfill your destiny. That heart of yours, which despite its waywardness and evil, in its serious moments reaches out for the stars and cries out for fellowship with the infinite God, that mind of yours, so fraught with evil imaginations, sensual images, and earthly aspirations, longs for communion and affinity with the divine potter. That body of yours, tired of its labors and wanderings, aching with loneliness, hungers for fellowship with the one for whom you were created. Whether the human heart beats in a body darkened by the rays of an African sun, or the sepia tone frame of an oriental, or the white bleached body of a Scandinavian, it cries out in the language of David, My heart crieth out for the living God. God made you. You were fashioned in his own image. You were made for his fellowship. You were made for a purpose. You were made on the majestic wheel of eternal destiny in the image and likeness of the Creator. There are thousands of people here in Louisville that admit and confess that they're unhappy. Economic security, recreation, pleasure, and a good community to live in have not brought about the peace and happiness that they expected. The reason is that man was created in the image of God and can find no complete rest, happiness, joy, and peace until he comes back to God. God had a purpose in making you. His primary purpose was that you would have fellowship with him. If man does not have fellowship with God, he is lost, confused, bewildered, and does not find his place and has a sense of not fitting. You were not only made for a purpose, you were made with a will of your own. That wonderful prerogative called choice or preference. This will of yours is capable of obeying or disobeying, of choosing life or death, darkness or light, heaven or hell, sin or the Savior. If there is no will, there can be no true love. God wanted us to love him willingly, with a free heart, by choice. Now this was a calculated risk on God's part. 
but it was the only way true love and fellowship could be achieved. As we all know, man failed. Curiosity, lust, and pride caused man to turn his back on all the golden promise of Eden, its fertile fields, its fruit-laden gardens, its abounding rivers, its indescribable beauty, its unspeakable fellowship, its artesian fountains, and to ply his erring way to the forbidden tree with its peculiar beguiling. So the image, God's vessel, you, became marred. We cannot fathom the depths of this mystery, but we do know that it happened. That paradise of peace was turned into a prison of confusion. The sun sank over the fringe of Eden, and the gloom of despair and loneliness settled down upon the world. Man who a few hours previously had basked in the glorious light of Eden, now hid in the shadows of a haunted forest, and the sword of his conscience cut deeply into his soul. The vessel had become marred in the hands of the potter. Man had become a sinner, a transgressor, a disobedient child of creation. He was immediately classified as an alien from God and even as an enemy of God. Strewn along the shores of time can be seen the wreckage of sin's devastation. History is full of it. Cain vanishing into a forest of condemnation with his innocent brother's blood crying from the ground. The faithless people of Noah's generation slipping into the relentless flood of God's judgment. The suffering of a wicked Pharaoh as he wantonly defied God's plea of mercy. Or Samson, who once knew the presence of God's spirit, blindly and remorsefully turning the mill of his enemies. King Saul, consumed with envy, falling on the edge of his own sword. Jezebel, defiant and unbelieving, cast from the window of her palace for the dog street. David, broken and shattered with sorrow, brought on by his own imagination. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The Bible says be sure your sins will find you out. Humanity, like the fateful lemmings, running headlong into a sea of destruction. This is the tragic story of man. It seems that God's plan had failed. That Satan, who coveted God's throne, had outwitted the Most High and that the whole human experiment had ended ingloriously. But the potter was not thwarted by the marring of his vessel. The divine craftsman who had fashioned the stars as gems in his diadem of glory, who had sped the Milky Way across the heavens as a train for his feet, who had set the sun in the sky as a candle before his throne, did not lose hope when a vessel became marred. Immediately, in love and mercy, he put his plan into action to restore the marred vessel to a vessel of honor. Even in the judgment which he pronounced was a hidden promise of hope. He said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The seed of the woman was to be the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who would someday come and fatally bruise Satan's head and restore ruined man to God. So although the story of Genesis contains tragedy, it also holds out radiant hope and a golden promise of restoration. The fall, the mowing of man, had proved one thing, that man's righteousness had utterly failed. God gave him liberty, and he abused it. God gave man strength, and he dissipated it. God gave man privilege, and he squandered it. This vessel, which God had created, broke at the point of man's responsibility and became utterly marred. But what happened in Eden was a preview of what is happening every day in the human drama in the United States and throughout the world. God doesn't hold you responsible for Adam's sin. He holds you responsible for your own sin. Every day, a million Eden scenes are reenacted. Men trade their divine rights for pittance of pleasure and trade their favor with God for the tardy things of this world. Each day, a thousand sons of Adam slip away into the shadows of their spiritual Eden. But now as then, God in patience and tenderness seeks to restore and redeem his marred vessels. The same power of choice which leads man away from God can lead him back. Obedience is still the test of love. The will must be yielded and conformed to the will of God before restoration can be complete. Through Christ, a way has been opened to God. But now, as then, we must approach Him in the manner which He has prescribed and not our own. And God says the way that we approach Him is by repentance of sin and faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. 
thirdly, he made it again into another vessel. My first impulse was to use the word mended at this point, but it doesn't really fit the picture nor the parable. Jeremiah doesn't say that the potter mended the vessel. It says rather that he made it again into another vessel. I seemed good to the potter to make it. Our ruin was complete, but our redemption is even more complete. We were utterly marred, but we are made completely new in Christ. We were utterly lost, but we are saved through him to the uttermost. Salvation is not a patching up of the old man. It is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The divine potter made it again into another vessel. I have seen good to the potter to make it. The emphasis today in many circles is on patching up the old nature. They see in it some degree of righteousness remaining, some hope apart from a divine miracle, some way of skirting the doctrine of the new birth. Think good thoughts, do good deeds, be the man you ought to be, we hear on every hand. But ladies and gentlemen, may I remind you in all earnestness that human nature in its unredeemed state is helpless to think good thoughts, to do good deeds, to measure up to God's requirements and God's righteousness. How many have come to me here in Louisville, Kentucky, as the man did that I referred to a few moments ago, broken, confused, and lost, burdens that seemingly cannot be lifted, problems that seemingly cannot be solved, sins that seemingly cannot be forgiven. So many people in this great city, as in all cities of America, are searching, questing, and looking for something in life they have not found. They have been marred and they realize it. The Bible says, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath broken down one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. A gospel that appeals to man's reason or man's righteousness will always be popular. For man likes to feel that he can circumvent the cross of Christ. If Paul had gone to Corinth with the excellency of speech which he was capable of, all of Corinth would have followed after him. But knowing that man must be reminded that his righteousness and his reason are both rejected by God, he preached nothing but Christ and him crucified. The cross set aside the flesh altogether. It left no footing for man to stand on. It put the responsibility of man's redemption upon Christ. Had not man failed and was he not and is he not continuing to fail? Hasn't history proved that there are none righteous, no, not one? The cross comes in with its mighty power to bring low as well as to exalt. For it exalts none but those whom first it humbles. It calls the pious worshiper to come out of his ivory tower in which he trusts and take his place at the foot of the cross with the outcast and the vile. It tells the earnest seeker and the anxious inquirer that by their own efforts they are made not one whit better until they put their hope fully in him who was slain. It tells the sincere orthodox whose mind is a treasury of doctrines that he must stand beside the drunkard and the harlot and say, God be merciful to me a sinner. I realize that these are hard sayings, but the Bible says that the cross is an offense to the righteousness of man. The cross levels every man. It says all of sin. It decrees that every man marred by sin must be remade. It is more than pardon, for forgiveness cancels the old wrong, but it leaves a man where he is morally. It is even more than justification, for justification makes a man judicially acceptable in the sight of God. The cross meant life. The theme of the New Testament is life, eternal life. In Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So the heavenly potter, through a process which unfolded through the centuries, made again another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make it. But the will of man remains intact. The first man used his will to choose death. You must use your will to choose life. Every provision has been made. Every promise is yours, but it will not be forced upon you. You must use this God-given power of choice, for every man decided the way his soul shall go. God invites, but you must come. The Bible says the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. 
and let him that heareth come, and let him that is the first come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. But you must make the choice. You must, by your own volitional will, say yes to Christ. You must receive him as your Lord and Savior. It is an act of decision, an act of commitment of your will to Jesus Christ as Savior. And the moment you do that, the Spirit of the living God comes into your heart and performs a supernatural act of surgery and makes you a new creation and gives you a new heart. The Charlotte Crusade is now history, closing last evening with the largest audience we have ever preached to in a closing service. Several television stations blanketed the two Carolinas with the service, and hundreds came to give their lives to Christ. This past week has been one of the greatest we have ever witnessed, as some of the leading personalities in the South have come to Jesus Christ. The entire state of North Carolina has felt the impact of this crusade, and all of us are grateful for your prayers. Today, we're in Columbia, South Carolina, where in a short time it will be our privilege to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ at nearby Fort Jackson. There's an air of tenseness and yet expectancy today all through the state of South Carolina as thousands of people are beginning to gather for this historic service. Hundreds of people prayed through the night last night that the Holy Spirit would work mightily and that many would come to a saving knowledge of Christ this afternoon. South Carolina is a beautiful, prosperous, and historic state. The people are proud and independent, coming from French Huguenot and Scotch-Irish ancestry. In this state is where you find Southern hospitality at its best, and where grits, cornbread, black-eyed peas, Southern fried chicken, and country ham are a part of everybody's diet. From historic Charleston on the East Coast to the booming textile center of Greenville, this state is growing, expanding, and the standard of living is rising with every passing year. The people of this state are extremely religious, and probably more people attend church per capita than any state in the Union. Columbia is a city of churches, but like other growing metropolitan centers, has its share of spiritual need. We have come here today at the invitation of the churches and the commanding general of Fort Jackson, and seldom have we witnessed as much enthusiasm, excitement, and expectancy for a single-day rally as we find here in Columbia today. Like many southern states, South Carolina is anxiously watching developments in Arkansas and Virginia relative to the complicated racial problem. During the past few weeks, emotional, hysterical, and inflammatory statements have been made in North and South. In some places, bombs have exploded. Synagogues, churches, and schools have been destroyed. However, these are only isolated incidents. I am convinced that the overwhelming majority of the people in the South of both races want goodwill to prevail and are violently opposed to the use of force and violence. There is basically a warm friendship between the races here that provides a basis for perhaps even better understanding than in many of our metropolitan areas of the North in the years to come. It is most unfortunate that much of the world judges this part of the country by a small, minute extremist minority and sometimes forget that some of the finest Christian people in the entire nation live in this part of the country. As a result of the outbreak of violence in many parts of the country, a number of people are becoming fearful that certain hate groups are taking advantage of racial tensions to bring about violence. It was this same sort of thing that brought Hitler to power in Germany many years ago. These are only symptoms of a deep unrest within certain sections of our population. Today, there are millions of Americans who are living in the bondage of other types of fears. And today, I want to discuss the subject of fear in the life of the Christian. Whether you will admit it or not, there are few of us who do not experience fear in one way or another. Man is the only creature on earth whose existence is passed in a state of dread, who is a prey to constant fear of one sort or another. Some people are possessed of physical fears. They live in constant dread of the loss of health and go to great lengths to keep themselves in the best possible physical trim. I meet people who have social fears. They're afraid of contact with other people or they're fearful lest they will not receive due recognition. Many a man doing business on Main Street operates his business with fear surging through his heart. He has fears concerning his competitor, the loss of business or of money. Still others are possessed of political fears. 
politicians fear their constituents and only too often trim their principles to suit the opinions of the voters. A United States Senator told me recently that a bill that was absolutely morally right would have little chance of passage in the United States Senate due to the pressure put upon various senators from pressure groups. Even a United States Senator is afraid of pressure groups. There are others who have fears regarding their appearance. They're afraid of being out of fashion and because of this they will almost bankrupt themselves to keep up with the latest fads and fancies and literally sell every virtue to keep themselves in style. To them, keeping up with the Joneses is the biggest thing in life. There are thousands of people who are afraid of death. To them, death is a complete mystery and unknown. They shudder and tremble and break out in beads of perspiration at the very thought of dying. I know a wealthy business tycoon who refuses and has forbidden anything concerning death to be spoken of in his presence. He has a mortal dread of the word. A doctor said some time ago, fears are the most disruptive thing we can have. I know a lady who is in a mortal dread of germs. She stays inside her house, the prisoner of her own fear, lest she should meet one. She doesn't realize that fear itself is ten times more deadly than the germ. I know a businessman who had a basic fear which brought on a stomach ulcer. When he got rid of the fear, he got rid of the ulcer. Fear even upsets the animal kingdom as well as the human kingdom. When bad dogs are around cows, the cows will often refuse to give their milk. And even when they do give it, the milk which is fed to calves will cause colic. So milk from contented cows is no mere slogan. It is a necessity. A famous psychologist said, Fear is not natural, but faith is. I am so made and constructed that worry and anxiety are sand in the machinery of life. Faith is oil. I live better by faith and confidence than by fear and doubt and anxiety. A John Hopkins doctor said some time ago that we do not know why it is that the warriors die sooner than the non-warriors, but that is a fact. We are inwardly constructed in nerve and tissue and brain cell and soul for faith and not for fear. God has made us that way. Therefore, the need of faith is not something imposed on us dogmatically, but it is written in us intrinsically. We cannot live without it. To live by worry means ultimate destruction of body as well as of soul. Jesus one day said, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubic unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. In other words, Jesus said we are not to fear, we are not to be anxious, we are not to fret, and we are not to worry. The Bible teaches that this type of fear is sin. There's another type of fear that the Bible says is sin. In Proverbs 29, 25, the Bible says, The fear of man bringeth a snare. This is a fear that has sent many thousands of people to outer darkness. This is the fear that will bring millions before the great judgment of God. They've been afraid of what men will say or do should they cut loose from the old life and take a firm stand for the things of God. This is one of the reasons why many thousands of people refuse to accept Christ as Savior. They're afraid of what their fellow man will say if they confess Christ openly. Sin has made many a man fear-filled. There are many hundreds of men today who would rather face the shot and shell of a battlefield than to make a public confession of Jesus Christ as Savior. Again I say, the fear of man bringeth a snare. That is a paralyzing fear. I pray today that you will have the courage to step out and declare yourself on God's side, that you will stand up for Christ and be counted on the Lord's side, and that you will confess Christ to the whole world. 
There are even Christian leaders who come under this category that the fear of man bringeth a snare. A pastor said to me in a foreign country a couple years ago, I would like to support the crusade, but I'm afraid of what the bishop would say. Here was a man whose convictions told him he should be participating in a crusade to win others to Christ, but the fear of man had brought a snare. A pastor came to me on the West Coast and said, I want to support your crusade to win souls to Christ, but I'm afraid of what Dr. So-and-so will say in his paper. The man to whom he referred used to preach the gospel himself, but now spends his time finding fault with others who are preaching the gospel. He has become a moat remover, not realizing what a large beam is in his own eye. He has lost power with God and influence with men, yet the pastor of a small church on the West Coast knowing that he ought to be in the crusade, was afraid that he might be named in this editor's religious gossip column. The fear of man bringeth a snare. I am grateful every day that God has delivered me from this fear. My wife said to me just this past week, we should never be moved by the applause or the criticisms of men. Blessed is the man when applause does not cause him to compromise his convictions concerning the gospel nor does criticism sway him from going straight to the target and proclaiming Christ and him crucified. One of the great problems among evangelicals today is their fear of each other. They're afraid of what somebody else will say. However, there is a legitimate fear that the Bible talks about. In more than 300 separate places we find the words the fear of God or the fear of the Lord used in the Bible. What does it mean? If you look up the word fear in the dictionary, you will find it described as an emotion stirred by impending or imagined danger which removes to a defense against it. And then its second aspect is an element of fear which is distinctly reverential toward beings or persons who impress us with their superiority and particularly religious emotions. The first legitimate fear, as spoken of in the scriptures, found in the 111th Psalm where we read these words. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, the Bible says that there is no person who can begin to live until he has the consciousness of the right reverence toward God in his heart. You can't begin to have wisdom, the Bible says, until you get your heart straightened out with God. All the education of the world won't do it. All the departments of all the educational institutions can't do it. There are no academic degrees that can give you the beginning of wisdom. The only thing education can give you is knowledge, scientific information, logical relationships of facts. But only the fear of the Lord can give you the beginning of wisdom. The word of God declares that you cannot live sensibly. You cannot have joy and peace in your heart until you know what the Bible calls the fear of the Lord. It is impossible to find out about the phenomena of life if you leave God out. Leave God out of everyday contacts of life and you have Bolshevism and the misery of anarchism. Leave God out of government and you have poverty and despair in the nation. Leave God out of your home and you have the thing that comes before my eyes every day of some man and woman making shipwreck of the possibilities of peace and happiness that God gave to them when he made the institution of marriage. Leave God out, young man, and whether you make a million or are a failure, whether you go to high places or are never known, your life is never going to be satisfying because it is the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. This type of reverential and trustful fear that comes from a heart that has made its peace with God is desperately necessary for true happiness in life and it's an accompanying wisdom. The second legitimate fear that every one of us should have is the fear of sin and its consequences. The Christian would do well to fear the world and all of its allurements. Satan has so engineered the broad way of which Christ spoke that he has it laid out alongside the narrow way and he has made it to appear a way of attractiveness. Let us all fear lest we are self-deceived and find ourselves longing for what Egypt has to offer and wishing that we were still going the way of the world. Let every Christian fear that first step in the wrong direction which would bring dishonor to the name of Jesus Christ. The third legitimate fear that the Bible speaks about is the fear that should come upon the wicked and the sinner when he realizes the terror and the judgment of the Lord. In Job 18.11 we read these words, Terrors shall make him afraid on every side and shall drive him to his feet. The Bible declares that the sinner and those that are without Jesus Christ should be desperately afraid of the judgment that is yet to come. The Bible warns of hell and its misery for those who reject his son Jesus Christ. 
it is right and proper that you should fear the terror of the Lord. I have heard many people say that fear is not a legitimate motive for a man coming to Jesus Christ. That statement is completely unscriptural and unbiblical. Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men. The judgment is about to fall upon you. But I have good news for you today, and that is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, can come into your heart, can quiet your nerves and anxieties, can take your fears away. And God says, there is therefore now no judgment to them that are in Christ Jesus. You need not fear death. You need not fear judgment. You need not have any fear in your soul today if by faith you will accept Christ into your heart right now wherever you are. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that thou wouldst remove the wrong type of fears and give us legitimate fears. Help us to reverence God. Help us to realize that we have a responsibility to Him. And may the Holy Spirit gather to the cross of Christ this day all that thou hast chosen in Him. And may many come bringing their sins of confession and repentance. For we ask it in His name. Amen.
Thank you.